So today uh, we're going to start discussing a new kind of cryptographic system <clears throat> involving elliptic curves. And it's important to understand the general idea in algebra of what is a group. So let me just review what I did in the last lecture. And excuse me, Professor, Um, quick question. Do you know when we'll get our grades back for our midterms? Uh, hopefully by tomorrow night. Okay. So a group is a set G with a binary operation. So a binary operation just means that for every pair of elements in, in G, X and Y, there's associated some other element. I'll write it as x star y. Um, and it can be called anything you like. It's sometimes called addition, sometimes called multiplication, sometimes called convolution. The different names for the operation, depending on what is traditional in a given setting, with the following three properties. So the first is associativity. So if you have x times y times z, that's the same as, as x times y times z. So for example, if you're looking at addition in the integers, 7 plus 2 plus minus 5 is the same as 7 plus 2 minus 5. That's associativity. If you were looking at multiplication, 7 times 2 times minus 5 is the same as 7 times 2 times minus 5. That's associativity. There's an identity element. E in the group with the property that e times x and x times e is always equal to x. So for example, for addition, the identity element is the number 0. 0 plus 7 and 7 plus 0 is 7. For multiplication, the identity is often written as 1. 1 times 7, 7 times 1 is still 7. And the third property is the existence of inverses. That means that for all x, there is a y such that x times y is the identity, and y times x is the identity. <clears throat> so for example, for addition, the additive inverse of 7 would be minus 7, because minus 7 plus 7 is 0. The multiplicative inverse of seven would be one seventh. Well, seven times the seventh is one, and so on. These are just examples. But if you have a binary operation on a set that's associative, there's an, an identity element and their inverses, it's called a group. And the group is said to be commutative or abelian. They're often synonymous. If x times y is y times x, we're all x and y. So the order in which you do the operation doesn't matter. Like 7 times 2 equals 2 times 7. And 7 plus 2 is 2 plus 7. If you learned about matrix multiplication, well, you did. You learned about matrix multiplication in linear algebra. And you know that if you have square matrices, the matrix multiplication is not commuted. So we're going to use, oh, and one other very important group. So important groups that you've seen so far. The integers under addition is the binary operation. 
the rational numbers under addition as the binary operation. This means the non-zero rational numbers under multiplication. The integers mod mz, this is congruence classes, under addition. C mod PZ star. So this is when P is a prime, and this is the non-zero congruence classes under multiplication. This is the integers mod P, sometimes written F sub P. That's an additive group, an additive abelian group, in fact. And Z mod PZ star, or FP star, is in multiplicative abelian group. So these are groups that we've seen so far. And elliptic curve cryptography is based on a new additive group which is a little bit more sophisticated than the one example I've just seen. So the idea is you have um, curves in the plane. So you looked at this in calculus. You might have uh, a function y equals f of x. And the graph is some curve in the plane, like maybe y is equal to x cubed minus x. So if you graph that, it's 0 at minus 1, 0, and 1. And the graph looks something like that. <clears throat> you could think of this also as you have a function of two variables, f of x, y, which is y, no, the graph, so let's just look at it like this. This is, um, so you have this y equals x minus x, and then what, what you're looking at in, in the graph, the graph or the curve is uh, the set of all points x and y in R2 in the plane, that satisfy the equation, y equals x cubed minus x. Sometimes you can solve for y in terms of x. You could have a curve like um, uh, x squared plus y squared equals one. So I'm not writing y as a function of x, but the set of points that satisfy that equation, this is just the unit circle. Okay. And you, know, you can have things very complicated. 7x cubed y to the fifth plus 2x cubed y to the 19th plus 32 equals x squared plus x to the seventh minus 9xy. So this is some kind of set of points in the plane. I don't know what they are, but you find all the points in the plane that satisfy this equation and you get some kind of curve. Now, <clears throat> I will say that um, if you know Maple or many other uh, bits of mathematical uh, software, um, you can actually graph things like this. I'm sort of curious. So I just wrote that down as uh, some random, messy, complicated thing. Uh, Let's take a look, just out of curiosity. Um, let me see if I can share my screen with the Maple worksheet. There it is. And
What was that curve I just looked at? I have to stop the share, I think, to see. Oh, no, there it is, okay. So in Maple, there's a command called implicit plot, which we use for curves. So this was seven times x cubed times y to the fifth minus two times x to the seventh times y to the nineteenth plus 32 equals x squared plus x to the seventh minus nine times x times y. So I think that was this <clears throat> random polynomial I wrote down and say I want to graph it from minus 20 to 20. So there actually is something there. Look at that. Um, Okay, anyway, um, but the idea is you have a curve and you can try to graph it. It's impossible to do it by hand, except in trivially small examples, um, but you really need a computer or at least a graphing calculator to do it. Okay. Um, so we want to study certain curves, which are called elliptic curves and we have no, these have nothing to do with an ellipse um and the origin of the name is somewhat obscure but an elliptic curve is the set of solutions to an equation of the following form now um y squared, if it were y squared equal to quadratic, it would be, it really would be an ellipse. Uh, or it would be an ellipse, a hyperbola, or a parabola. So when you have quadratic equations, they've been studied for thousands of years. Uh, this is just a little bit more complicated. It's y squared equals a cubic in x. And it's even simplified, it's not even an x squared term, just a linear term plus b. So an equation of this form is called an elliptic curve. And what does the curve look like? So I just uploaded to um, course materials in Blackboard 
chapter six in the textbook by Hofstein and others, which is about elliptic curves. And it shows some pictures of some curves. So here's the first elliptic curve, E1. So E1 will be the curve Y squared minus three X plus three. So in this case, A is minus three and V is three. But the second example I give of an elliptic curve is Y squared Oops, I'm sorry, I left off here. Uh, about the cubic. Y squared is x cubed minus 3x plus 3, or y squared equals x cubed minus 6x plus 5. And this a is minus 6, and b is 5. And elliptic curves have um, a characteristic shape, actually two characteristic shapes. So let me look at the graph of these things. So I want to share my screen with Maple. So now you should see these curves. So the curve y squared is x cubed minus 3x plus 3. If I graph it, it looks like this. So it comes down. No, okay. The second curve, y squared is with x cubed minus 6x plus 5. When you graph it in the plane, you're just looking at real numbers, x and y, that satisfy the equation. It actually has two components. It has a piece that comes down like this and another piece there. And this is also characteristic. Let me just make up some other random examples. Suppose I make this two and this seven. What is that going to look like? Oh, looks like that. Suppose I make this plus six plus five. That's going to happen. Huh. Looks like that. If I make this 15, I'm going to see whether I can get another curve which has two pieces with a little circle. How about I make this minus 22? Ah, two pieces. That's good. Hmm. I do this to scale. What does it look like? And from one to ten, do ten. So I'm going to just use um, maple to draw n different graphs. The ten different graphs where this n goes from one to ten. Let's see what happens. One has two components, and then it's just one component. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
so in any case, the point is that elliptic curves, when you graph them in the plane, <clears throat> they tend to either look like this. Notice there's a y squared. So if x, y is a solution of this equation, x minus y is also a solution. So the graph is symmetric around the x-axis. That is, if, if x, y is a solution, then x and minus y is a solution. Because y and minus y squared are the same thing. So the graph is always symmetric around the x-axis. And it will typically look like that. Um, or it'll look like something like that. Okay. Um, now, the amazing fact or discovery is that it is possible you can add two points on an elliptic curve and get another point on the curve. So this is going to be a binary operation. Your set of points is all the points on the curve. That is, it's the curve. And we're going to define a way to take two points on the curve and add them to get a third point on the curve. And then it can be proven, part of it's a little bit messy, so I'm not going to do it all, that you can define this addition of points on the curve in such a way that you have an abelian group. There's an identity you can add, you can subtract, dissociate, everything is nice. Now, it shouldn't be a complete surprise that there's a way to add points on a curve and get another point on the curve. Um, for example, if you look at the equation y equals zero, the curve, it defines is the x-axis. And if you have two points on the curve, there's a way to add them and you get another point on the curve. The curve is just a straight line. It's just ordinary addition. Or um, you could take the unit circle. That's the graph of x squared plus y squared equals one. So there's a way, now we'll call it multiplication instead of addition. If you have two points on the unit circle, you multiply them. If this makes an angle alpha with the x-axis and this is an angle beta, the product makes an angle alpha plus beta with the x-axis. And so multiplication of complex numbers of length one, that's multiplication, we get a group. Here we get an additive abelian group, but we just call, we just choose to call it the operation addition. Here we have a multiplicative group. So it shouldn't be 100% surprising that sometimes when you have a curve, there's a way to add points and get another point on the curve. So there's some sort of addition law. And the addition law is a little bit strange. And, it's, and I'll, I'll say what it is. So this is the addition rule and the addition law for points on an elliptic curve. So the basic case, the simplest case, and it's also the basic case, but we have to deal with two other cases. Let's say we're in a situation where our curve looks like this. So let's say this is a point P and this is a point Q. So we have PQ 
on the curve. So what do we do? Well, we draw the straight line through P and Q. And we'll show in a moment that the straight line through P and Q always crosses the curve at exactly one other place. Let's call it R. See, this is the x-axis. I didn't draw this very well, but symmetrically on the x-axis. So you might say, oh, so P plus Q is going to be R. And the answer is no. A little bit strange, but because the curve is symmetric around the x-axis, if I reflect this through the x-axis, I get a point down here, let's call it R prime. And we're going to define the sum, I'll use this, a plus sign with a circle around it, just indicate this is my addition on the curve. P plus Q is going to be R prime. So I take P and Q, two points on the curve, draw the line through them. It crosses the curve at a third point, reflect that point through the x-axis and call that R prime. So that is the addition law on the curve. Um, so let me do a numerical uh, example. So let me take the curve y squared equals x cubed minus 15x plus 18. Actually, let me see if I can also do this at the same time in Maple so we can sort of see visually what's happening. So So the curve I'm looking at is x cubed minus 15 times x plus 18. And that's what it looks like. Um, Professor, are you trying to show us something oh, on sorry. Maple? Me, uh, go to the yeah, because we can't see it. Yeah, we can't see it. <laughs> So here's that curve, x cubed minus 15x plus 18. And right now, it's actually drawn to scale. If I didn't use scaling constraint, it would look like that, but this isn't drawn to scale. It doesn't actually matter. And maybe that's a better picture. See, that's this curve. And a point on this curve is um, seven sixteen. Let's just check. I have made the do check in since I'm in Those are one to substitute x equal to what can I say? Seven sixteen. Uh -huh. So if I plug in <clears throat> x equals seven and y equals 16, I get on the both sides 256. And so that point 716 
lies on the curve. Let's see what's another point that lies on the curve. If I let x equal 1, I get 1 minus 15 minus 14 plus 18 is 14, which is 2 squared. So if I let x equal 1 and y equal 2, in this equation, I get 4 equal 4. So let me just say points on the curve. We just found two of them. 7, 16, and 1, 2. So A equal seven sixteen and B what may I just going to be B B equals seven sixteen and Q equal one two lie. On the curve. Let's see. Let me go back and see where they are. So the point one and two is right about there. And the point seven sixteen is up there. And one is here, and one is there. Now, what I said was the rule is to draw the line through P and Q and find where it intersects the curve. So my curve looks something like this. One point was here, one point was here. So this was P, this was Q. I want to draw the line through these two. So the line through 716, so the line through 716 and 1, 2. So what is the slope of that line? 16 minus 2 over 7 minus 1 is 8 over 6 or 4, four thirds. So the equation of the line is y equals 4 thirds x minus 1 plus 2, which is 4 thirds x plus 2 thirds, perhaps. When x is 1, this is two, when x is seven, this is not, let me do, it's not right, so 16, my, oh, 16 minus two is 14 over six, that's seven over three. So this is seven over three. So seven thirds minus two is one third. Let's see, seven, 16 and one, two. That line has slope 14 over 6 or 7 over 3. So 7 over 3, x minus 1 plus 2 is 7 minus 7 thirds plus 2 is minus a third. Let me see if that looks like it's right. And then x is 1, this is 2. And then x is 7. This is 49 minus 1 is 48 over 3 is 16. So that looks like it is correct. So this is this line L. Okay. So we have the line. Y 
y equals seven thirds x minus a third, where does this intersect the curve? So let me plug this into the curve. The curve is y squared equals x cubed minus 15x plus 18. So the points that satisfy these two equations, if that's the case, then x will be, you'll have x cubed minus 15x plus 18 equals y squared, 7 thirds x minus a third squared, which is 49 over 9 x squared minus 14 over 9 x plus a ninth. So I have to solve this equation for x. I'm doing it the old fashioned way instead of using a calculator or a computer, but let's see. So um, just to make life easy, I'll multiply by nine. 9x cubed minus 9 times 15 is 135x plus 162 equals 49x squared minus 14x plus 1. So 9x cubed minus 49x squared minus 121x plus 161 equals zero. So X should satisfy this equation. Now we know X equal one, Y equal two, X equal one satisfies this. Let's just check. If you let X equal one, nine minus 49 minus 121 plus 161, this is nine and 161 is 170. 121 and 49 is 170 equals zero. So that looks like this is okay. Now, we know this is a cubic in X, so it should have three solutions. Now we know X equal one and X equal seven satisfy this equation. So we should be able to find the third solution by hand. Let's see. Um, I can do it either by long division or synthetic division. Let's see if I remember synthetic division. The coefficients of this equation are 9 minus 49 minus 121, 161. And I want to know, so the, effectively what I'm doing is I'm dividing x minus 1 into x cubed into 9x cubed minus 49x squared minus 121x plus 161. Okay. And hopefully, and, and I know this will go in evenly because x equal one is a solution, but if I bring down the nine, nine minus 40 minus 40, 81, Something is off. Oops. Oh, no. Uh, minus one sixty one, minus one sixty one, zero. So this says if I divide x minus 1 into this, I get 9x squared minus 40x minus 161. But you can do the long division and check. Now we also know that another solution of this equation was x equals 7. So if I do synthetic division 7 into this, get 9, 63 makes this 23. 7 times 23 is 161 gives 0. So x minus 1 times x minus 9 divided into this polynomial, 9x cubed and so forth, gives me 9x squared 
my sorry, nine X minus 23. So, Nine X plus twenty three. Yes. Something's not good. Nine minus forty minus one sixty one. Seven with nine. Twenty three. Sixty one zero, so it's nine x plus twenty three. Ah, right. So nine x plus twenty three equals zero. X is minus twenty three over nine. So uh, again, if you're not sure what I'm doing here, um, let me just explain just the general fact. If you have a polynomial f of x. And if it has a root a, then f of x, if you divide it by x minus a, it divides evenly. There's no remainder. f of x is x minus a times g of x. So I start with this polynomial, and I know two of the roots of this polynomial, x equal 1 and x equal 7. So this is divisible by x minus 1. I do my division. I can either do ordinary long division or synthetic division, which is something which they used to teach, maybe still teach in high school, or they should. In any case, it's just a quick way to do this division. This is going to be divisible by x minus 7. So I get that this polynomial 9x cubed minus 49x squared minus 120x plus 161 is equal to x minus 1, x minus 7, x plus um, times that, plus 23 over 9. I'm sorry. 9x cubed minus 49x squared minus 121x plus 161 is x minus 1, x minus 7, x plus 23 over 9. So that's what we know. And divide it by 9. Let me just repeat this, uh, what I did, because I don't want it to get, it's not supposed to be so complicated. We have an elliptic curve. X cubed minus 15X plus 18 equal Y squared. <clears throat> by luck or by magic or whatever way, trial and error, I found two points on the curve, 7, 16, and 1, 2. And then you check. You plug those numbers into the curve, and they're they satisfy the curve. So on this elliptic curve, here's the point P, here's the point Q. There are two points on the curve. I want to draw the line through those two points and see where it intersects the curve. So the line through these two points P and Q is given by this equation. Y is equal to 7 thirds X minus a third. So I want to find all the points x, y that satisfy these two equations. 
in that case, x cubed minus 15x plus 18 is going to be equal to 7 thirds x minus a third, which is y squared. So I expand this out. I simplify the polynomial. I get this polynomial. And I know this has two roots, 1 and 7. So I do long division or synthetic division, and I see that that polynomial, um, this polynomial factors, it's x minus one, x minus seven, x plus 23 over nine. So on my curve, x equals minus 23 over nine is the solution. So let me see, let me go back to sharing the screen with my maple. So here is the curve. And I, and I drew the, I used a, this, a command called implicit plot in maple to draw the curve, that's not important. But I have these two points on the curve, one, two, and seven, 16. I wanna draw the line through them. So let me see if I can figure out how to do that at the same time. So I also want to draw the line y equals x minus 1 times x minus 7 times x plus 23 over 9. Let's see if this works. Hmm. Oh, we got the practices. Now it was second. Oh. My line was y equals seven thirds x minus a third. Seven divided by three times x minus a third. Okay. But I didn't write a third, I wrote 13. So let's see if it now works. Okay, good. Um, So hopefully this you can now see. So this the round piece and this circular kind of piece goes, that's the curve. And this is my line. And this goes through the curve at the two points I found originally, one, two, and seven, 16. But this doesn't look like one, two, because it's not drawn to scale. If I draw up the scale, it is now it's drawn exactly the scale. I mean, like it's clearer or less clear. But this red line cuts the curve in these initial two points and in the third point. So this point R, where it cuts the curve, that's the point R that I call it. Let's see what that is. Um, suppose I want to solve the equation. Solve. I want to solve these two equations for x and y. Uh-huh, so when I solve those equations for X and Y, 
I get the first point that I have, x equal 1, y equal 2. The next point, 7, 16. And the new point, when x is minus 23 over 9, y is minus 170 over 20. That's this point. So, let me, uh, the share and let's sort of draw a picture to see how far we've come. So we have this elliptic curve that looks kind of like this. And we had two points on the curve. This is the point one, two. This is the point seven, sixteen. And I drew the line between them. And it hits the curve at a third point, which is minus 23 over 9, minus 120 over 27. So if I were to call this P and this Q, this would be R. But because of the symmetry of the curve, because it's Y squared, I know if I reflect through the X axis, I get a new point R prime, which is the same X coordinate, but the negative of the Y coordinate, which makes this one plus 120 over 27. So P plus Q is R prime. That is, on this curve, if I take the point 7, 16, and I add the point 1, 2 on the curve, the way this is addition is defined, however weird it might be, this is minus 23 over 9, 120 over 27. Sorry, I said one set one point, but I think I misread the case. Yeah, 170. 170 over 27. Okay. So that's the sum of these two points. Now, there two other questions to ask um because this is the standard case but it's not the only case um what's another case well suppose we add p plus p so you have just the point p on the curve you can't um Draw one line through one point, there are infinitely many lines through that point. So what we do in that case is we, so we don't have two lines through the point. We just have we have we don't have two points and then one line through the point. We have one point, but we do something analogous to what we do in calculus. We draw the tangent line to the elliptic curve at this point. Find the point where it crosses the curve again, reflect to the x-axis, and that's going to be the sum. So, So let's um, let me just sort of explain that. So suppose we have like part of our elliptic curve, our elliptic curve, 
looks like that. And here we have a point P. And we want to add P plus P. So what we do is we find the tangent line at P. Where it crosses the curve, that's the point R. We reflect that through the x-axis. And this point R prime is what we define to be the sum of P plus P. Now you can say, how do you find the tangent line to the curve? Well, you learned that in calculus. Uh, we can use implicit differentiation. So let's recall the point P is the point 716. So and what is our curve? The curve that we've been looking at is y, y squared equals x cubed minus 15x plus 18. So we compute dy dx by implicit differentiation. This is just calculus. This defines some function of y implicitly. When you do implicit differentiation, you get 2y dy dx equals 3x squared minus 15. So dy dx is 3x squared minus 15 over 2y. At the point p equals 716, what is this equal to? This is 3 times 7 squared minus 15 over 2 times 16. Let's see if I can do arithmetic. 7 squared is 49. 3 times 49 is 147 minus 15 over 32. This is 132 over 32, if I do this correctly. If I divide this by 4, I get 4 into 13 goes 3. 4 into 12, I get 33 over 8. So dy dx is 33 over 8. So, so Professor, you took the derivative um with um respect to y, right up there, so right? Dy dx. Okay. So this is y squared equals u minus fifteen x. If I wanted to do it, find dy dx by implicit differentiation, mm -hmm. I differentiate with respect to y with respect to x. I get two y dy dx. Mm -hmm. The derivative of x cubed is three x squared. Derivative of 15x is 15, derivative of 18 is 0. So dy dx is 3x squared minus 15 over 2y. And I want to find the tangent line at the point 7, 16. So x is 7, y is 16. I get that the tangent line has slope 33 over 8. So the tangent line has slope. 33 over 8, and it passes through the point 7, 16. So the line will be 33 over 8, x minus 7, plus 16. Let's see if I can figure what that is without using the calculator. 33 over 8, x minus 7, 3s are 21. 7 threes are 21, 23 over 8 plus 16, which is uh, 16 times 8 is 128 over 8. So this is 33 over 8 minus 103 over 8. So that is the tangent line. Let me go back and look at my maple. Let me draw the tangent line here. So the tangent line, um,
So I want to plot the curve. And now the line I'm plotting is y equals 32 over 8 minus hundred and three over eight. Let's take a look at that. Uh-huh. That's completely off. Let's see. This, this is supposed to be passing through the point seven sixteen. And it doesn't. So what is wrong here? Oops. Supposed to be the tangent line T in this curve. So it has to go through. Oh. Let me share the screen. Okay, here we go. So this is now the tangent line at the point 716, which is here. If I actually just graph the horizontal line 16. This is the horizontal line y equals 16. So right there, it crosses that's right, so that's the point 716. The tangent line crosses the curve at this point. It's hard to see what's going on here. So let me just blow this up a little bit. Maybe I'll go from, uh, that's going from uh, one to eight, see what happens. Bless you. Bless you, Professor. So here's the tangent line, and it's crossing the curve right down here, close to three and a little bit below the x axis. And then you reflect that, and that's what the sum will be. So let me actually. Use maple to find that point. So I want to solve the equation. Y equals, this is the tangent line, this is the curve. So the intersect at 716, and the other point of intersection is x equal 193 over 64, y equal minus 223 over 512. So this is a little bit more than three, and this is about two fifths. So that's the coordinates of this. Suppose I actually graph this from, uh, Minus one, two, uh, eight. Let me see a little bit. So,
No, this is the top. But this is the this is the new point on the foot. You know, ninety three over sixty four. Yes, and if I wanted to actually get this as a decimal, so it's easy to see what it is. It's equal to three point zero one five something, and y is minus zero point four three five something. So that's this other point on the curve. So this is that line, this is the tangent line, and it's hitting the curve at this point. Let me see if I can. Yeah, this is mine. So here's the curve. Here's the point P, 716. I draw this tangent line, and it hits the curve at a second point. The x is 3, and y is minus 0 0.4. And then I'm going to reflect that back across the x-axis. And I get um, so when P is equal to the point seven sixteen on the curve, P plus P is the point. 193 over 64, and the negative of this, which is 223 over 512. So that is what happens when we add a point to itself. When we add a point to itself, the line we use is the tangent line to the curve of that point. Now, there's a second potential problem. And suppose that this is the situation. Suppose we had our elliptic curve, and this is at my point P, and my point Q, I take to be minus P, just the reflection. And I want to take P plus minus P. Okay. P plus minus P. Now, I do, the line between them is just going to be the vertical line. That doesn't hit the curve that we see anywhere. So how do we define the sum? So um, we add a, a point, it's called a point of infinity. So our elliptic curve, the points in our abelian group, the group we're constructing on the elliptic curve are going to be the points on the elliptic curve Union with another point, which is the point in infinity, which we'll write as a curly O. This is the point at infinity. And we'll say that P plus minus P is O. And this is going to be the identity element in this group. Um, P plus, the, we define P plus the point at infinity to be equal to P for all points P. In fact, the way we think of it is this. Here we have our curve. Here's a point P. The point in infinity, think of it as being up above the point. You draw this vertical line through P and O. It hits the curve at the third point, minus P. 
And then when you reflect this around the x-axis, you get back to P. So geometrically, that's why we can say P plus the point at infinity is P. Let's look at one more point just to emphasize this uh, and then clarify it perhaps a little bit. We're still looking at that same elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed minus 15x plus 18. We found the point P716 that lies on the curve. We found the point Q, which is um, 1, 2 which lies on the curve. We found the point uh, R, which was um, R was minus twenty three over nine and minus one seventy over twenty seven. Then the reflection of this point. R prime was on the curve, minus 23 over nine, minus one seven over 70 over 27. And in fact, the sum of P plus Q was equal to this number R prime. When we took P added to P using the tangent line, we found the sum, which was, what was that point? One ninety three over sixty four, two twenty three over five twelve. There's one more point we can find on this line uh, that's easy to find. If we let x equal 3, we get 3 squared minus 15 times 3 plus 18 is 9, no, 3 cubed, is 27 minus 4 plus 18 is 45 minus 45 is 0. So the point three zero 
also lies on the code. So let me just see where that is when I look at the curve. Let me come back and share the screen again. So yeah, three zero, that's the point right there. Okay. Um, just look at the curve of that cell. There's the curve, three zero, that point lies right on the curve. And the three points that lie on the x-axis, one is here, one is here, and three zero is the an easy one to see. Um, what can you say about that? Well, Here's the point three zero. Now the tangent line at that point was just vertical. So this three point three zero, when you add it to itself, gives you gives it gives that point at the thing. So Three zero added to three zero is the point that can find it. Okay. All right. That is addition on the elliptic curve. Uh, the only thing I have to specify is, so an elliptic curve is y squared equal x cubed plus ax plus b, and we need a condition, which is that we only consider curves where a certain number, which is called the discriminant, 4a cubed plus 27b squared is different from zero. If this equals zero, then this cubic has a double root and it makes things messy. So we only consider cubics that satisfy this condition. So for example, in the case that we've been looking at, A was minus 15, B is 18, and you can check that 14 times minus 15 cubed plus 17, 27 times 18 squared isn't zero. This condition is satisfied. Uh, so we had a decent curve to look at. An elliptic curve, the, we, only, we only look, most elliptic curves satisfy this condition. 4a cubed plus 27b squared is not zero. On such a curve, we define uh, addition by this chord and tangent process. Um, that is, you take two points on the curve, draw the chord between them, intersected with a, it, it intersects the curve at a third point, reflected through the x-axis, and that's the sum. So if you're adding a point to itself, you take the tangent line, see where it intersects the curve at a third point, and reflect it around the x-axis. Now, the only thing that's clear here is that this is abelian, because if I take points P and Q and draw the line between them, it's the same line if I called, if I drew the line, the line through P and Q is the same as the line through Q and P. So P plus Q and Q plus P, if they're defined at all, they have to be the same uh, point on the curve. So this is going to be a billion. And I define this point at infinity, O, where O plus P is P for all points P on the curve. And for every point P on the curve, P plus minus P is going to be the point of infinity. So we have an identity. 
The only thing that is difficult, really messy to verify is the associative law. And I'm not going to verify that because that's a long, uh, week long algebraic calculation. And, um, but you will have to believe the authors and the mathematical world in general that this chord and tangent process does give a well defined addition law on the curve. And this is our elliptic curve. And you might ask, how is that? connected to cryptography. And the answer is, uh, it's very much like the discrete algorithm. So remember the discrete algorithm. You have a prime P, a primitive root G, and a number um, H, and G to the X is congruent to H, mod p. So given p, g, and h, find x, which is defined to be the discrete logarithm of h with respect to the primitive root g. So, and the point is, this is hard. And a hard problem allows you to do cryptography. In our case, the analog will be this. Given an elliptic curve, E, and points, I'll call it A and B, on E, such that B is N times A, that just means A plus A plus A, N times, find N. And this turns out to be also hard. And it's the hardness of this problem that allows us to create a cryptographic scheme. And one which is, in fact, widely, widely, widely used. Um, not as much yet as RSA, but it is a very um, good, if you like, um, piece of cryptography. So that's what I'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, and that's it for today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank Have you. a great day. You too. Bye-bye.